Hey, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is John Lieberkind. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Grandhood. Um, so our key message is think pension just simpler. So what is Grandhood? Well, Grandhood is really our unique synonym for retirement. So think about it this way. You have a childhood, you have adulthood, and now you have a, a grandhood. So really, we are trying to embrace uh, the third stage of your life as something you actually want to live, something you want to do, and something you want to commemorate. So we're building a seamless pension experience for small business owners and their employees. So I've really been asked here to talk about my fundraising experience, not about grandhood. So that was crazy, the brief intro about grandhood. Um, so grandhood has a collaboration with a strong partner bank, which is Sexo Bank. Uh, so that is like a good old-fashioned partnership in the sense that it's at arm length. It's not really a co-branding strategy. It's not really a white labeling strategy. It's a revenue sharing model. So when we make money, they make money. So we take care of the customer experience, the branding, and the asset management, while Saxo Bank delivers bank infrastructure and access to financial markets. So really, this is what I came to talk about. Uh, so Grandhood's funding journey looks like this. So uh, I moved back home to Denmark uh, after I've been abroad for five years. Uh, so I came home from New York in 2016, started on my own, matured my pitch deck, matured the concept, uh, then uh, visited Pre-Seed Ventures and Seed Capital uh, in Lyngby in the beginning of December 2016. And I know that these guys just told you that it's about building relationship and building trust, and it is. But I actually have a little funny story here, because when I left, and that was the very first time I met the partner out there, I'm not going to say who it is, but that was the very first meeting, and he was virtually, so this discovery loan, maybe that's something for you. I need to clear it with my colleague who knows a little bit more about FinTech than I do, but basically, he said after the first meeting that they were willing to, uh, to grant us a discovery loan, which is a convertible bond. Uh, so that, uh, that came into effect in January. And then the real relationship building started. So uh, being the CEO of a, of a startup, one of uh, the key responsibilities, in my opinion, is really to build investor relations. So I actually made a great deal uh, of building the relationship with Pre-Seed Ventures and the given investment manager on our deal. Uh, kept him in the loop as to our strategy, and he actually played a great role in uh, our pivoting, if you will, of a strategy. So we started out with an idea that we wanted to build a B2C robot advisor. Uh, but together with that investment manager at Pre-Seed Pre Ventures, among others, we quickly found out that unit economics didn't look as appealing, customer acquisitions were usually higher than expected, and customer lifetime value are lower, that you have a higher churn than you have in a B2B pension solutions. Uh, so we actually spent around six months entertaining that idea before we pivoted. We actually made it as far with that idea uh, that in the summer of 2017, we had an offer at hand from a, from a large Swedish bank that we, that we decided to walk away with. And I want to say that we managed to raise our pre seed round in September 2017 because of the pivot, not despite of the pivot. So I think that's an interesting takeaway. Um, so having built that relationship, having sort of engaged the investment manager, having him on board as part of the journey, actually enabled us to raise uh, roughly a half million US dollars in a pre-seed round in uh, September 2017. So with that money, we, uh, we made some, uh, some key hires, uh, matured the concept, uh, to an extent that we were able to raise some soft funding in May 2018 from Innobooster. Um, and uh, at that competition, if you will, we raised around 170,000 US dollars. So that's soft funding, i.e. non-dilutive. So that's obviously a, a, a pretty, pretty good deal if you're able to land that kind of money. Um, so with that, we again made some key hires, sharpened the idea, and I want to leave you with one takeaway is that you can't be too narrow and too specific in what you want to build. So we really, since January 2017, just spending our time narrowing it down, really going from general to specific, general to specific, general to specific, until you nail the hypothesis. Um, and I believe that's what we did when we, in the summer of 2018, managed to raise a fairly large, uh, fairly large seed round of around 3.2 million US dollars 
bearing in mind that we're still not live in the market, we still don't have any customers, we have a lot of signups, but we're not live yet. So that's meaningful. If you aggregate this, that's roughly 25 million Danish kroners pre-launch. Pre um, so that's meaningful funding. And if I am to touch upon some of the things that we did well, as you guys touch upon, it's about the team, really. It's about having the strongest founder team that you can imagine. That is as simply as that. You need to have the strongest founder team for that specific case that you're presenting to your VCs or, or business angels, for that matter. So I made a great deal of an effort to find co-founders that had completely different skill sets than, than my own. So I have a co-founder who is a lawyer, uh, and I have a co-founder who is a quant who, do, who does the algos uh, and does everything numbers, where I do more sort of the commercial role in the company. Uh, so find co-founders with different skill set than your own. I think that's an important takeaway. Then it's about finding a market that is enormous, right? If you look at the Danish pension fund market, it's roughly twice the Danish GDP. And the European, uh, the European pension fund market is, I think, around 7 trillion or something, right? So it's just an astronomical market. Make sure that the barriers to entry is super high, super high. Just think about it. How many startups do you know who are actually trying to build a 100% digital pension fund solution? You have some startups that are trying to attack pockets of the market. But to our knowledge, uh, even in Europe, you haven't really seen a player that really want to challenge the incumbents on the way that you distribute pension saving solutions to small businesses and the employees. So that's really what we're trying to do. So the takeaway here, find an astronomical market, high barriers to entry. And I want to dwell a little bit upon the high barriers to entry because what does that even mean, right? So high barriers to entry, in, 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 in my opinion, is the pension fund market is actually a, a good poster child for that because it's deadly boring to most people. So already there, you've filled it out, a lot of eager uh, gals and uh, guys and gals that there's just not so many people that are interested in pensions, right? It's, it's pretty dry for most people. So you already weeded out a few people there. But then you actually need, in my opinion, and that's just my opinion, you actually need some kind of industry expertise. So me and my two co-founders, we all have a background from investment banking, but from various pockets of the market. So I used to be a chief investment strategist with Mel Lynch in Wall Street, on Wall Street in, in New York. And uh, my other co-founder, he used to be a short-end Euroswap trader with Danske Markets. And my third co-founder used to be a chief legal advisor with Danske Markets. So find co-founders that actually have a high knowledge of the industry that you're trying to disrupt if it's fintech, in my opinion. Um, then it's all about uh, hiring the right people. I want to I wanna pause myself because it's already been a lot about what we have done well. Uh, one thing I would have done different is to find a classical technical co-founder, so a classical CTO type. So I don't have that in my founder team. I have an Elgo guy, but I don't have a classical CTO. If I could have done it backwards or do, do, done it again, I would make sure to find a classic CTO from the get-go. Uh, because you learn the hard way how uh, difficult they are to come about. So, um, so uh, with that, I would jump, uh, jump, to, uh, jump to hiring, because once you secured the money, well, the jury is out, right? That, that's really when the pressure starts. Everything is such a con congratulatory, uh, congratulatory win that you fundraise, right? Obviously, the means to an end, but that's when the pressure really starts to hit, right? And one of the things that your VCs want to see you execute on is uh, attracting top talent, right? Otherwise, you're not going to build a killer solution. So being able to attract top talent actually ties into what I started with, right? Find top-tier co-founders. Because if you are to attract top talent, you need a top-notch co-founding team, right? Because how are you going to attract a guy with a 10-year track record from the Danish pension fund industry if he doesn't respect the founder team? That's going to be very difficult, right? Um, how are you going to attract one of the best UI, UX product, product designers from France, have him relocate from Paris if you don't have a top-notch product manager? How are you going to attra attract one of the best mobile developer out there, have her relocate her and her family from Singapore to Denmark if she doesn't believe that you have the best 
talent and the strongest founder team and the strongest vision, you're just not, right? So again, it all ties back to the founder team. The founder team is going to be sort of the generator for hiring T talent. Um, one thing is hiring uh, top talent. Another thing is keeping them. And that's something I learned um, maybe the hard way, because I come from investment banking. And that's really just one way. Either you pay them or you fire them, right? That's really that. That's sort of the two strings you have in investment banking. It's up or out. Uh, it's a bit more nuanced in, in startup. Um, so, uh, so I think that, uh, that actually requires a lot from the founders, especially if you're a first-time founder. And actually, my entire founder team, we're all first-time founders. And we all come from banking. We all come from a culture where you work hard, and you keep your head down, and you wait to payday. That's not how it works in a startup. So that's something you have to learn and sort of work you through into. And we're still learning as we go. Uh, but the key takeaway I want to leave with that is that know what motivates different people, right? A CTO is motivated by one thing. A product manager is motivated by another thing. And a lead fronted, fronted developer might be motivated by an entirely third thing. So quickly identify what your employees and your key hires are motivated by and try to implement it as soon as possible, which leads me to a final uh, point, which I think is extremely important. And I think most startups fail to do, at least we did in some kind of way, is to think about HR in a startup very early on. You think that being in a startup, I mean, everything, every, everyone are buddies, and it's 100K uh, power. It is. But you still need HR. You still need to understand that you're working with people. They have different incentives. You need to do the walk and talks. You need to do the, the quarterly reviews. You need to build an incentive structure. And I think most, at least first-time first founders, fail to realize that HR in a startup is super important. I'm going to leave you with that, and hopefully the video is is able to play. Um, it's a 20 second video. That's granted. So so we take the first one about basically on you know how to how to raise money so basically there's uh, i think there's basically two questions the first one the first one is is it better to bootstrap that means no funding initially than take early stage funding and this, the part question there if you take early stage funding is it better taking convertible note than a loan other than, than equity um, i can start just very briefly and say that I never met a startup that say, oh, gosh, I should have taken money in earlier, in perfect hindsight. It doesn't exist. But I meet a lot of founders who say, ah, if we had waited six months, <clears throat> then maybe we could have taken it ourselves, and maybe we'd have less dilution so we can raise more money later on when the value goes up. So I think that's my short I think the convertible note versus equity is really a long <laughs> answer. But I think that's me on bootstrapping. What do you think, Alexander? Yeah, um, so I fully agree. Um, we should oh, now there. Cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, there's a certain stage where it makes sense to take in money, and it shouldn't be too early, also because you're not going to get to the next value inflection point where your company kind of grows in value for the next investor to come in. Um, so, of course, it makes sense. And uh, then um, I'm an investor, so I really urge you to take in. <laughs> you You've got a point where you're saying yes or no to these companies. Oh. And you said yes or no to a whole bunch of companies. So can you give us a couple of examples? Feel free to anonymize them. And if you're thinking of an example next time, can you give us some specifics? Got some nice, juicy, like, some examples of things that have made you say yes on KPIs. On the KPIs? Yeah, on, you, on the KPIs. Oh, yeah, yeah OK. Um, growth, like this, growing straight up is also really nice. Uh, um, the best ex uh, Danish guy from Google, for example, combined with the, you know, a super business guy, uh, kind of like a founder team that is incredible. Is that what you're looking for, Nick? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, yeah exactly. I mean, have, you, have, you, have you got like an example? Of, I mean, have you, Nick and I mentioned them. Have you actually invested in a team where you weren't crazy about the product, but you loved the team? 
Mm. Oh, yeah. It, it happens quite often, actually. Um, people pivot like uh, Jon did with their startup, right? So, so you start up with an idea, and we get on, and we get, uh, you know, um, we, get, we, we get that flirting going, and we really be, believe in the team and kind of like the end vision. But there are always multiple ways to get there, and sometimes the end vision kind of changes uh, along, along the road. So yeah, a lot of times where we actually invest, and uh, it turns out to be something completely different. So from a robo-advisor to a pension fund, right? Um, cool with you guys. What did it feel like on the other side? What's that? Raise, raising money, and you know, when did you feel like you set the hook? When they said, yeah, no, for you with this question about the um, raising money or taking a note, did it fit exactly with your timeline? Did you have to run longer than you thought, or? So th this is the way I want to put this answer. This is not exact science, right? Um, and I don't think that's a right or wrong. Uh, that, but I had it to work for you, um, if given, just to give the audience so, an example. So the short answer, I wouldn't, ha I wouldn't have done it differently. The only thing I would have done differently is if I had the money to self-fund myself up until now, I might have done it. But, but as you know, we raised, we raised quite a lot. Uh, having said that, I actually think we, um, we got a lot of good uh, sparring out of our VCs. So I'm actually in the camp that I've been, I've been very happy with raising VC money. Uh, and it's been a good sparring partner. So a lot of the no's made you smarter. Yeah, I, I, think, it, I think our VCs had made us smarter on Shaba, yes. Yeah. Should we take one the other? Mm. Yeah. Um, so, so, okay, mm. so we take the number four. You know. So where do we find team members? Um, well, if I should start there, I think actually you're sitting in the right place. Yeah. So, so honestly, it's about talking about your idea to as many people as possible. Well, that are your classmates or a startup competition or, or here or pre-seed academy, you know, that, that's what I would do. Because not, none of us started with a great network, right? We, we have a great network because we have talked to a lot of people. Yeah, so I fully agree. It's all about getting yourself out there, attend events, uh, start uh, looking for the right profiles, you know, uh, on LinkedIn uh, and in, within your network, you know, ask who knows somebody that might be the relevant guy. and. Um, again, uh, coffee with a stranger is uh, a good way to, to start. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. And, and if I could just take one recent example, I met uh, a potential co-founder of a startup go into, and we, we, need, uh, we need a technical uh, co-founder, because exactly for the same reasons. Yeah. So we basically said, okay, let's take our entire idea and put it online and see if we can find the person. You know, what's really to steal? Yeah. So again, going out there online and offline and getting as much input as you can. I, I where did, where did you meet your team? Mm -hmm. What's that? Sorry, where did you meet your team? So how we hired Oki okay, Talent? Yeah. yeah. What's your story? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I think one of the greatest stories to highlight is that we actually managed to, m to relocate a mobile front-end developer from Singapore with her entire family. And uh, we, needed, um, we needed someone to code in React Native and we posted your job ad in a React Native form, and uh, we were successful in that. Yeah. What about your co-founders? You, did you know each other before? So uh, one of my co-founders I've uh, known since I was 14 years old, and uh, the other co-founder I studied with on uh, my bachelor's, and then he branched out uh, in the more quanti route. So. Cool. Should we take this about uh, standard deals? Uh, so, so what's, you know, the question is basically, you know, you get an offer that AKA a term sheet or an email from an investor, that could be a business angel or pre-seed saying, you can get this much money for X percent and all the terms. Um, I would say like in valuating a startup is really different because it depends on what kind of sta uh, startup it is. It depends on location. Startups in US is priced higher, but what does it matter when you're in Copenhagen? So I think my advice would be go out to talk to your peers. If you know, if you know your own, then of course it's all confidential, but we all talk about it anyways, right? So we say, so what do you think about this valuation? I think that would I would do because there's no magic formula. It's about seeing out there. And of course, if you have more, more than one offer, that's great for you. But in many cases, you get an offer here and then you get an offer in four or five months. So should you wait? And, and I would let that decision based upon basically what you hear in the market and what your peers are saying. 
How about no, you, you? Yeah, I actually have a, an interesting angle on this that it sounds like a cliche, but I really don't think it is. You can actually get a too high valuation too early on, especially if it's, um, it's a strategic investor or corporate investor. If you are fintech and one of your first investors are a bank, at least that what, was what we experienced, um, that you can actually get a super high pre-money valuation from a bank if uh, they believe in the case and the case has strategic value. But uh, what you end up, what, what you run the risk of is that you end up becoming um, an aqua hire. So all of a sudden you're spun into their strategic framework that has nothing to do with your vision. Exactly. And what's the specific problem with it? If your valuation is too high on your first round, yeah. what does that do to you later on? Well, worst case, you have to do a down round. And, uh, exactly. So I mean, it makes so, it really difficult to raise later on. And, and, and often you would see a strategic investor or corporate investor having an, an interest in ring fencing you. So they will give you way too, ha too high pre money value because then they know you're dead in the, dead, dead in the water for most VCs or business angels in particular. Uh, and then you're going to have a tough time breaking out of that and then you're an aqua hire. Right, that ring fence was a really prime trap is another word for that. Yeah, it's a value right. trap. So what, should we check the traction? So what does traction mean for you for software as a service? Yeah, because you go like this. What is this with the hockey stick? What would you what? want to see early on? Um, yeah, so it all depends. Oh, <laughs> no. no. Uh, yeah, early, early traction. So um, user love is, is the most exp important part, right? So that you actually have users uh, using your, 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 your uh, product. So for Vivino, they, uh, the first product wasn't that great. But you know, people kept coming back because it's the only place that you could act digitally within the wine industry, right? So, then that is the most important. So traction actually comes after user love. But towards traction, uh, um, yeah. So, so, so at a Series A, you say 100k uh, for for a MRR typical for a SaaS company, right? That's the rule of thumb. Um, we we don't have that kind of like narrow a narrow uh, band, band. Um, it's, it's, um, well I can add in a little bit yeah. on the angel because normally the most rounds are basically like either uh, like a public investor like you or basically a business thing like me and when I go into a software as a service startup most often there's a little bit of revenue or a little bit of you know or users right I'm mm -hmm. mostly into B2B so for me traction is mostly have you sent a few invoices right I think if you're in business to consumer, you know, none of us are paying for our apps. So most likely the traction there is most likely in terms of users and retention. Yeah. But for me, I would like that they have sent a few invoices and it seemed that the customers are sticking on. Mm -hmm. It might be recurring revenue of only 2,000 kron a month, something like that, right? Because then I say, okay, there's at least a few customers that are paying their bills. Yeah. And maybe you can even go out and talk with them and hear what they say. Yeah, yeah and... and then you, that you can indicate that you can do it again, kind of yeah, like the yeah, thing, exactly. right? So the early traction and you can scale it up. Um, so there are different levels, right? Where mm -hmm. if you go to a real VC later on, we, well, we normally would talk about at least 1 million euro in recurring revenue a year. Yeah, yeah, too. Yeah. So, John, have, do you have time for one more? Or where are we? Tell you what, if I could just do this really quick, John needs to be interviewed. So if you stand up and everybody applauds, you can leave and those guys <laughs> can talk for a <laughs> okay, few minutes. Cool. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Cool. We also need your microphone. You guys keep talking because it's going to get a time. Should we Second take the next one? On what, what participating know. pitch competitions and accelerators mean? Yeah. Um, I think it means, for me, two different things. Well, you won this pitch competition somewhere. It doesn't really matter. It gives, don't give that much credibility, so to say. I think what it gives you is visibility. So it's an opportunity that you meet this co-founder or employee or business angel or whatever. And it could also mean that you actually get some, some confidence. And of course, if it involves a little bit of money early on, 20,000 or 50,000 kroner actually matters in the early days. Mm -hmm. That actually means you can hire this student employee. So I think, again, it's, if it's about getting out there and getting disability, I would do it. Of course, as you get more mature, you know, winning 20,000 krona doesn't matter that much to you. Um, so that's at least what I, I don't know yeah, how you no, see. No, I completely agree. So pitch competition, winning them doesn't matter too much. Just the network, which is super nice. Of course, it gives you confidence. Accelerators, um, we really like accelerators. Uh, somebody else helping you with the, developing your business, and they 
do uh, some very good uh, accelerator programs out there. I'm working with one startup called Omnio, and they are almost professional accelerator participants because uh, they work in a B2B field uh, with huge corporates, and they all have their accelerator programs. And it's just a really nice way to get in the door at a huge corporate um, because you, you, know, you are inside once you are part of the accelerator. Mentor programs, of course, if you can, uh, the more cool people you can add around your startup makes a lot of sense. Small grains as much as possible, go for it. Um, free money is uh, awesome money. Uh, and we uh, encourage all our startups, also after we invest, to, 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 to try to receive as many grants as possible. With the grants, there's also um, people you can pay to apply for the grants. And there's some fields that are really make sense. I'm thinking Labster. Didn't they reach like 20 million worth of yeah. grants before? Yeah. The, this is a company that raised 20 million kroner in free money mm. in grants. But, so, but, like, but paying people to, how about this angle on, I see more and more companies and more consultants that will do the grant yeah. work for you in return well, for a fee. I, th I think the one thing you have to have in mind getting a grant is that grant, aka public soft money here, that is, you know, the, the government has to be very objective in giving money. Getting money from a business angel or uh, on this like pre-seed is about building relations mm. and drinking some beers and feel that we are on this journey together. When you get a grant, most often you have to send in an application. Actually, I'm in the startup. We have to send in an application on Thursday. Uh, and this is this way. It actually, the decision is mostly based on this application. So it's not based on your personality or whatever. It's based on this application where you write everything down. And if you're not good at this, you either have to become good at this. You can learn it. It's not rocket science. Or you have to get someone on the team or hire someone that can. Because I see a lot of, in one of my startups, we got 2.3 million euro in soft funding from EU. And we were lucky that we had the skills in-house to, to write the application because we've basically done it before. And I'll just say that these grants, also the small ones, like the inner booster, like the fund and fund entrepreneurship or whatever, they matter so much. And it's just a stupid thing if you don't uh, apply for those. And I'll say EU ones are very tough to write on your own because it's like 200 pages. And Inner Booster is four pages, you know, it's manageable and you can learn it. But it's also smaller amounts of money. Inner Booster, four pages, 400,000. Yeah, 000. but I'll say EU. for an early stage, 500,000 for an early stage Inner Booster, yeah. they actually go up to 5 million kroner. Cool. So, quick note of something have you guys seen the EU is often more and more asking for a pitch? to yeah. go along with the deck. But so. that's only in the finals. That's after you yeah, have you be selected, reached yeah. the 13.5 out of 15. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's something that comes later. We have time for another question because they're still uh, <laughs> miking up. So I guess that's for you, Alexander. Do you yeah. Oh, oh it changed. No, but we, we can do it really quickly. Nordic, Nordic, uh, yeah, no, we only invest in Denmark as of now. Only in Denmark, yeah. yeah. But Denmark used to own the entire Nordics, so yeah. that matters. <laughs> MVP for hardware. How many of you are involved in hardware startups? Hardware is hard, right? Uh, it's costly. Um, so I would say you have a harder time raising early stage funding yeah. because it's just really, really hard to do this iteration. Um, I'm sometimes involved in some of those, and, and you really have to be smart in doing stuff really, really cheap. Uh, so what was the question? Do we do it? I have invested in hardware startups, yes. You have also? Yeah, yeah, plenty of times. Uh, um, but I guess... We really like if there's a kind of like software layer to the hardware as well. It just becomes a bit more sticky and uh, you get to interact with the users on an ongoing basis. Um, and it's easier to get that uh, defensible barrier or moat in the long run. Yeah. We'll end on that note, just a quick... You guys meet a lot of hardware startups and you also meet software startups. I was hearing uh, a couple of smart people on a podcast this morning saying that um, all software people think that hardware startups are easy and all hardware people think that software startups <laughs> yeah. is just software, it's just code. Yeah, you do see that? All right. Listen, I'd like a big hand. Thank you very much, gents. Thank you.